coming back to the resolution. The resolution talks about holistic view from a rare diseases. And now we're going to hear more from international panorama, from the WHO, from UNESCO, and also from a program that works directly with people and their families living with a rare disease. But please, let me first introduce Dr. Rudy uh, Kresh, who is from WHO and production department there, and um, a dear friend to us in the rare disease community. So please, Dr. Kresh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anders, and a very good afternoon to you, uh, all participants in Dubai and online. How timely it is to celebrate the achievements in global health in these shaky times. Member states, with a lot of help from civil society organizations, from patients, from those who care, from advocates, from mothers and fathers, you can be proud of the UN resolution from December last year that addresses the challenges of people living with rare diseases and their family. We at WHO are so very pleased to see this re resolution as it contains strong language on how health systems can be strengthened and the need to advance on universal health coverage, on the power of networks, on needed measures against discrimination, on the cause of equity. The COVID-19 pandemic brings many of the societal shortcomings to the fore. And one of them is that many states were not prepared because their health systems were too weak. To assess a health system's performance, the availability, accessibility, acceptability, and quality of health services for rare diseases could be used as, as a lachmus test. Rare diseases are complex and often affect multiple body systems requiring expensive, specialized, and coordinated care. Many health systems around the world are not yet geared to respond to the particular challenges that are common to many different rare diseases. Equitable access across the continuum of care for those impacted by rare diseases will extend and improve their quality of life, but also Will they be of economic benefit to the individual and the health system? The vision of the Sustainable Development Goals is a world in which no one is left behind, including people who suffer from rare diseases. Just because the disease affects a small number of people does not make it irrelevant or less important than diseases that, diseases that affect millions. This is a quote that shall be the basis of my um, short speech today. It comes from the WHO's Director General, Dr. Tedros. With 300 to 350 million people affected worldwide and more than 7,000 different types of diseases known to date, rare diseases represent a major challenge in public health that has been largely ignored. Consequently, this is a field in public health and research that would certainly benefit from globally concerted action and international collaboration. Why, we may ask, are rare diseases a matter to be discussed at governmental level, at prime minister's level, at the UN? And I'm particularly so, so with regard to the ECOSOC resolution, and not only within ministries of health. Why are the solutions only possible if we act in solidarity across national borders? Viewing rare diseases through a global public health lens offers some perspectives. Rare diseases patients and their families are a particularly vulnerable group of citizens who experience scarcity of medical knowledge, difficulties in accessing adequate care, as well as isolation from society due to the rarity of their condition and the scattered expertise. In general, health systems are not adapted to rare diseases and there is little public health policy to respond to their specific needs. Access, access to the quality health care, overall social and medical support 
effective liaison between hospitals and general practices, as well as professional and social integration, autonomy, and independence. Universal health coverage means that all people and communities receive the promotive, preventive, curative, rehabilitative, and palliative health services they need of sufficient quality to be effective, while also ensuring that the use of these services does not expose the user to financial hardship. Health systems can learn a lot from rare diseases to design systems that are fit for the future and effectively contributing to universal health coverage. Rarity calls for increased international mobility of experts, as well as of patients, as the most clinically relevant expertise will most likely not be available locally. Will innovative solutions in E and M health be able to pool expertise and develop virtual centers of expertise? Could they help to create expert structures for the management and care of rare disease patients and bring together multidisciplinary competencies and skills to serve the spe specific medical, rehabilitative, and palliative needs of rare disease patients? Could accredited global centers of excellence help to provide best quality care based on available clinical evidence? Would we be able to globally find innovative ways of financing such centers so that patients and their families will not fall into poverty because of out-of-pocket payments related to the care of their rare disease. Pooling seems to be one of the magic words when it comes to rare diseases. It helps to bring together the critical mass and balance, low prevalence and incidence. It helps to focus the diffuse shadow light in which rare diseases are currently barely seen and create spotlights. Pooling of research and development, pooling of data, pooling of care facilities and pooling of experts. Lots of excellent work has been undertaken in recent years in this regard. The launching of the European reference networks is one of such initiatives. Could pooling also serve to bring in expertise uh, from around the world, from let's say people in India, from people in Japan, Australia, Canada, or China? A second word that comes to mind is Collaboration. Sean Ekins and colleagues, when reviewing the recent Charcot Marie Tooth research, suggested that it is unlikely that we are going to see a dramatic change unless there is a wholesale shift in the process of drug discovery and development, combined with increased collaboration between academics, industry, government labs, and research foundations in the rare disease arena. How will such a shift be concretely orchestrated? What incentives could be created that instigate such a change? One such incentive could be to collaborate to agree on thresholds for safe and clinically effective standards for diagnosis, care, and treatment, and to collect international best practice. And a third word that, might, that comes to mind is smart innovation. As technologies are advancing, we are confident that we will see routine in vivo gene editing in a medium time horizon. I added smart to innovation, as again, the global community can and certainly will learn from rare diseases. We are faced with the option of editing the human genome with ease and precision notwithstanding the potential of these applications to be beneficial to any one individual, unforeseen risks, such as epigenic and intergenerational effects, cannot be ruled out. Besides principled reasons, it is also because of these uncertainties that interventions seeking to modify the human genome are banned in many countries. On the other hand, the question posed by the US National Academy of Science and National Academy of Medicine is no longer whether or not the human genome ought to be edited. Rather, the question is what should be the criteria for heritable germline editing and what principles should guide the governance of human genome editing. 
such a shift in the approach to germline editing would probably have global consequences for individuals, societies, and mankind altogether. So on the way towards cure of some rare diseases, I humbly suggest going this path with caution. Colleagues, I'm sure that pooling, cooperation, and smart innovation will help to increase the attention to rare diseases globally. As we are moving forward on putting the issue of rare diseases on the political agendas of governments, it is now time to follow with actions in health systems strengthening for rare diseases, for a global network on rare diseases, and for implementing the governance measures against discrimination that we know will work best. WHO will be moving along this roadmap together with you, and I thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kresh. It is, um, if you were a politician and were running for a political party, I would for certainly have voted for you. I think you <laughs> have so many good parts in your program that is incredible. And seeing the track record WHO has done for rare diseases, it's, it's impressive, especially when, when you put the foot down or your director put the foot down for rare diseases to be a global concern. I thank you very much for that. I was thinking to have a follow-up question, and it's very complex to do and very difficult to do, but I have, <laughs> let me do one thing because I ticked on one thing you mentioned, and that was e-learning and m-learning. Would it be possible that we could do something together for those parts? Because I'm thinking about the low and middle income countries in the world. We've done yeah. a great job in Europe and in, in Northern America and other places, but we have so many other areas because this is also a global uh, conference. So would, would it be possible if we could set up some cooperation when it comes to e-learning and m-learning, do you think? Definitely. Um, and one of um, the work streams that we have in WHO is um, actually to look at those tran technological transitions. We will see um, a, a, a huge innovation cycle, which will be very fast in the next couple of years that make E and M health much more accessible to all and where actually um, uh, interventions um, uh, so counseling, but also medical interventions will be possible uh, through E and M health. Um, okay. And so this is a this is definitely an area which we are working on and which we would like to collaborate with you. You should only have one answer, and that was yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Good. I, I use this as an excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Kresh. And I use that as an excellent bridge over to the next speaker which we are very, very happy for the first time ever in the uh, our community world internationally is coming from UNESCO and coming from education and coming from IB. Madame Alama, I'm, I'm so happy to, to greet you and welcome you today. And we are eager to hear what you're gonna talk about. Please, the floor is yours. Hello, uh, good uh, afternoon. Everyone, I am uh, Amapola Alama. I'm head of unit of technical assistance at the International Bureau of Education uh, of UNESCO. We are based in Geneva. Uh, please, uh, I would like you to accept my congratulations on the passing of the UN resolution on addressing the challenges uh, of persons living with a rare disease and their families as a result of such an impressive work you've been and mobilization we have been doing. Secondly, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important event. I will start presenting, introducing the IBE, and uh, then uh, what we are doing on health and well-being education. Uh, I will uh, uh, underline where, where we can contribute to the implementation of the resolution. Um, the IBE is a UNESCO uh, institute specializing in curriculum development, implementation, and evaluation. And uh, we were created in uh, 1925. So we, uh, uh, 
a case where the, the daughter is older than the mother, who were created before UNESCO. And we became part of UNESCO in 69. IB is a, a global oriented field center. We support ministries of education in their quest to improve quality education by offering them technical assistance, institutional capacity building, and research based uh, knowledge experiences from a comparative perspective. Uh, to inform uh, decision making and uh, action. We do a lot of advocacy, of course, also. Uh, the IB draws on the experience and the abilities of ministries uh, uh, professionals to strengthen empowerment and motivation and promote sustainability. We are very attentive to the context, needs and real possibilities of change uh, in every country we support and uh, we work uh, uh, in a collaborative uh, perspective uh, of co-construction. So any change is owned and driven from inside the countries. Um, our speciality is curriculum. Uh, IBE has a systemic view of the curriculum, curriculum framework, curriculum content, textbooks and teaching material, teacher training curriculum, teaching practices. Uh, so that includes pedagogical approaches, assessment of learning for us are all interdependent and mutually reinforcing components of the curriculum. For us, they need to be aligned for a well-functioning education system with positive impact on students' learning and well-being. Uh, the reason why education system exists is for children to learn what, the why, the for what, the how, and how much students must, must learn are stipulated in the curriculum. This is why we say that the curriculum is at the heart of each education system. The curriculum finds the vision of society and of the citizens sought to be built through the education system. What is this vision of the society is a society where there is room for everyone uh, and as there may be room for everyone at school, no matter the origins and particularities of each children. When we speak of inclusive school, we do not talk only about a school that caters for different learning abilities. We do speak of a school that takes into account specific needs of children to make sure they are secure at school physically and emotionally so the school is capable of offering to each children the positive and the best possible conditions to learn. The principal objective of quality curriculum is that in, that is inclusive and fair is to enable students to acquire and develop the the knowledge, skills, values, and dispositions to lead meaningful lives. A key indicator of curriculum success is the quality of the learning achieved by students and how effectively students use that learning for their personal, social, physical, cognitive, moral, psychological, and emotional development. Uh, this is uh, why IBE has been uh, working on and introducing health education in curricula since 2008. Uh, in its new uh, medium term strategy, strategy 2022 and 2025, that has just been approved by I the IBE Council in January of the year, uh, there is a focus on health and well being education to support many countries of French-speaking African countries, West and Central Africa, for which funding is going to be made available for the next four years. Quality education is first and foremost an education that prepares for life and for living together in as much harmony as possible, looking after each other, respecting differences and fighting against prejudice and discrimination. This is why uh, many countries that included are looking to reinforce health and well-being education in their school curricula. The main objectives of health and well-being education are to disseminate accurate information and raise awareness on health-related issues in relation to general health, 
eye diseases, rare diseases, sexuality, education. It is also to unveil prejudice to fight against discrimination and to make children aware of how important it is to develop and adopt protective and responsible behaviors for themselves and others and to enable them in doing so to make informed decisions while showing respect and solidarity with others regardless of differences. This preparation for life is not only done by the transmission of knowledge to students, but also above all by developing psychosocial and social emotional skills that students should manage to mobilize widely and in a timely manner to identify and solve the concrete problems they face in their everyday life. Uh, these strategies for health and well being education will contribute to different points of uh, the UN resolution addressing the challenges of persons living with a rare disease and their family. As it does with the curriculum, the IB uh, approaches health and well being education in a systemic way. Firstly, by not targeting specific issues, but rather by addressing health and uh, well being as a whole. Secondly, by involving all areas of the education system that play a role in the curriculum, from design to implementation phase, from curriculum developer to teacher trainers, supervisors, heads of schools and teachers, as well as non-educational staff in schools, but also the community at large. As part of uh, the IE strategy for 2022 and 2025, first, we are working on developing capacity building courses online and offline, as well as tools for member states to support them in transforming schools into health and well-being promoting spaces where every agent of the schools, from the director to the learners, educational and non-educational staff, work together to ensure that learners acquire skills, adopt behaviors essential to their growth and healthy environment, as well as living harmoniously together. These courses and tools will include working to build prejudice, change discriminatory attitudes, toward persons affected with diseases, including rare diseases, but also developing caring attitudes and therefore to foster the equity and inclusion in all the school and beyond in the community. Equity means treating uh, in a way differently persons that are different in order to reach equality. Second, the IB is working on, uh, on supporting member states in transforming schools into spaces where there is room for all children. We contribute to the Happy Schools UNESCO's program. This evidently implies developing children's social emotional skills, most notably empathy and communication, to allow children to be able to relate to their peers beyond their differences identifying what they have in common that is much more than what makes them different. Finally, the IB is working in developing training contents and teaching tools specific for teachers to implement health and well-being education in schools. These tools will also include changing attitudes and behaviors that of the teachers as much as of the learners regarding persons affected with rare diseases. I thank you for your attention. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions, thank you. I thank you. I thank you, and Madame Alama. It, it's a um, great speech what you did and, and great presentation. It's a dinner table that is really, really attractive to us. So my, my um, short question, which can uh, be answered with uh, only one um, word, is that are you ready for us to come and cooperate now? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. We will do that. Time is running short. And so that's happened when we have a very full and interesting program. Next speaker, Mr. Michael Lögren, is working at the Ogrenska Center in Gothenburg, who is its center of knowledge to work with children and families who have a rare disease. Ogrenska has developed a specific program, and Michael is going to talk about 
how that implies and what we can do is not that. Most welcome, Michael Lugrid. Thank you so much, Anders. And a great big thank you to everybody coming together today, making this come true. My name is Michael Lovgren, and I work for the Orgrenska Foundation in Sweden. And I'm going to introduce you to the Orgrenska National Family Program. And I'm hoping to give you an example of an, an intervention that strives to contribute to some of the goals in, in the resolution, the UN resolution. Having a child with a rare disease changes everything. It causes severe concern for the present and for the future. It affects the child's and the family's relation to work and occupation, to healthcare, to insurances and economy, to school and education, to social services. We call these five areas the big five. And it is our view that regardless of where in the world you are born, a rare disease will have consequences to all of these areas. Financial and cultural differences will, of course, make differences in the, in the circumstances, but universally, it will have this multifaceted impact on your life, and it has to be met with a, a holistic understanding. This is a heavy burden, and the only one who can truly understand what the parent going through this is going through is another parent with the child with the same rare disease. And based on these insights, Orgrenska has designed the Orgrenska National Family Program. The Orgrenska Foundation was founded in 1989 under the patronage of Queen Sylvia of Sweden. And we are proud to still have the Queen's support as of today, as she so generously expressed in the introduction of today's program. Orgrenska is a member of ECOSOC in the United Nations and is a co-founder of the NGO Committee for Rare Diseases, hosting today's event. Orgrenska does many things related to rare diseases, but this national family program is at our core as an organization. The program, the program invites families nationwide in Sweden with a child with the same rare diagnosis to participate together for one week, Monday to Friday, staying on Lilla Amundern on the west coast of Sweden. It's an intervention where parents, children with a diagnosis, their siblings, and professionals working around the family are all included. Our setting is by the sea, close to nature, and importantly, it's calm and soothing, giving breathing room for meaningful connections between people and a, a fruitful learning environment. The program is designed to make each member of the family meet with others to acquire new knowledge, to develop tools to aid them in taking control of their own lives. To achieve this, parents and children have their own separate schedules for eight hours each day throughout the week. Parents take part in lectures from top experts on topics that are important to the specific rare diagnosis, from the medical sphere and the latest research, to insights on society support systems, and discussions on everyday coping, coping methods. They do, this, they do this together with the other parents. And they have time throughout the day and in the evening to share their thoughts among themselves. And in our reviews or evaluations, the parents clearly emphasize that meeting with other parents in a setting like this is tremendously valuable to them. And this has remained true since we started in 1989. Meanwhile, the children with a diagnosis, they are taken care of in their own daily schedule with guidance from our pedagogues, with games and activities designed specifically for their abilities and with methods applied that they can learn from themselves that help them overcome and bridge some of their limitations that they might have. They get to express and reflect among themselves with support from pedagogues and in, in uh, talks with a doctor and a psychologist present. For the children to really feel safe and to enjoy and find value in these days, a lot of experience and work and attention to detail goes into fine tuning every bit of this program. From meeting the family and greeting them as they step out of the car to adjusting the, the food to any possible dietary conditions and applying picture supported communications and accessibility in all parts of the, of the environment, 
everything. And this is very crucial for the parents to be comfortable leaving their children with us. Young children for hours at a time and sometimes leaving their child for the first time to anybody. So we really need to pay attention. And our evaluations show that parents express that this trust is the key for them to be present in the journey that is their side of the program. Similarly, the siblings are in groups of their own and the sibling perspective is one that we take very seriously and one that we urge never to forget. They exchange experience between themselves, ask their questions to experts and reflect and learn together for their futures. Pedagogues support the children to do their schoolwork throughout the week that they brought with them from home. We employ and develop methods in that situation that support their learning, and then we communicate the results with their home schools. We found that the diagnosis has specific pedagogical implications, and we've observe, observed and compiled systemically for several years. And that has resulted in a, a very exciting material for pedagogical research. And in a few months' time, we will publish an article on this topic that we will be very happy to share with everybody and anybody who's interested. Among the more than 5,000 families that have gone through our program, many have expressed that they view their life as divided in before and after participating in the program. In our view, a focused intervention like this makes a big difference to the family's quality of life, short-term and long-term. In our experience, it directly addresses several of the calls outlined in the resolution. It contributes to addressing the social development and inclusion challenges by reaching families early, providing tools, experience, knowledge, and context to kickstart their travel, traveling towards empowerment. It contributes to social integration and physical and mental well-being by breaking isolation, by providing a setting for social exchange, a setting to find, join, and to build networks. It promotes inclusive and equitable education by the research, the research on pedagogical consequences, developing and spreading methods to bridge limitations in the learning environment. It works toward the dissemination of accurate information, the compilation and dissemination of disaggregated data, and the creation of multidisciplinary expert centers. And it does so by continuously collecting firsthand experience from families in a setting where they exchange with medical experts and other professionals. And this is an invaluable setting for research, data collection, and for knowledge exchange and dissemination. In addition to directly contributing to these goals I mentioned now, it's also our view that it foundationally enforces the effectiveness of healthcare and other institutions. The early empowerment of the families increases their capability to engage with the, uh, with the society resources effectively. And the UN resolution calls us to strengthen the health systems, provide universal access to quality, quality services that are integrated people-centered and community-based. And these crucial systemic improvements to institutions and services on one hand, and the direct empowerment of families to engage with assistance more effectively. These are two perspectives that we like to see go hand in hand. We have developed our family program over the course of 32 years, and we constantly tune it and improve on it. The area disease, the rare disease area is a complex one and our work is never finished. And it's a global issue and the international cooperation is crucial and vital to our ongoing progression and eventual success. Orgrenska Foundation is in many ways a small actor, but the message from the 5,000 families that have participated in our programs, their message speaks loudly. And we would like to to share, and we would be proud to share with anybody who's interested, our experiences of the family program. And we would like to invite you to contact us and to exchange with us with your ideas and your inspirations so that we can engage with you and have mutual impact from one another's work and our ideas and inspirations. Because when it comes to working toward these common goals, 
we view all of us as one big family. So thank you. Thank you for coming here today and thank you for having me. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Very good and very interesting program, I think. Um, maybe not surprisingly, I think so, but I still think so. Thank you very much for that. I'm thinking about time is time is short, but I'm, I'm thinking of one, one perspective. When listen to you all here, we, we see the complex bill, the picture of the complex picture of living with a rare disease and for the full family. We hear it from uh, WHO, we hear it from IBU, and we hear it also from the practical on, on site from Ogrenska. I'm thinking that we also need, and that maybe be the lesson for the next big event we have, and that is to involve the Ministry of Finance, the, the system that holds the money and to create cross budgetary and cross-organization cooperation. So we leave it for that, and we, we save it here, and I thank you all three for your contribution, and um, I'll leave it over to you, Duran, to continue. Thank you all, guys. Thank you so very much, Anders, for that delightful panel. And thanks to Michael, especially for making it here to present to us a Grenska. Every time I hear about a Grenska and I see the program, it really does inspire us again in terms of what it is that can be done, but also the family work that you do. 